In the next two sections I'm going to talk about glycopeptides and I've divided them into two sections because uh, I'll cover the uh, naturally derived glycopeptides uh, such as vancomycin and tacoplanin in this particular presentation and in the next one I'll talk about the semi-synthetic uh, glycopeptides which include televancin, ortavancin, uh, deblavancin. So these are, as the name suggests, glycopeptides. Uh, so they're peptides that contain some uh, sugars that are attached to them. These are very large molecules, about on average or more than 1400 Daltons. Immediately that should tell you that these would have a very difficult time getting into porins and therefore will not be able to get into the gram-negative bacteria. So predictably they have a coverage that's restricted to uh, gram-positive bacteria. So uh, the other thing is that these are cyclic peptides and I'll show you a uh, structure in a second here. And because they contain the sugar molecule and they are uh, cyclic peptides, they're soluble. Um, but the disadvantage is that they're not orally available because they would uh, be easily bro broken down in the stomach. So these are available as IV delivery mostly. Again, vancomycin and tycoplanin, which I'll discuss in this presentation, are natural uh, substances, whereas the other ones are semi-synthetic, and I'll talk about those in the second presentation. But they all uh, work in a very similar mechanism. So here's uh, vancomycin, which was uh, discovered more than 40 years ago, and uh, it's just that it wasn't much useful at the time because we had um, penicillins, we had penicillinase resistant penicillins, and the other drawback of vancomycin was that it's not orally available, it had adverse effects, so it wasn't much useful uh, until we started to see uh, very resistant strains of Staphylococcus aureus, particularly uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and then vancomycin uh, became more popular because it was an alternative of, to um, those drugs for the treatment of MRSA. Now the mechanism of vancomycin is very unique. What it does is that it binds to the two alanine residues that are part of the pentapeptide which is attached to the NAM sugar. And by attaching itself very tightly, it prevents the transfer of the sugars onto the growing cell wall. So let me show you that uh, here. Remember that we have here the cytoplasmic membrane, this is the cytoplasm, and this is where this sugar molecule, so here's the NAM energy, and NAM has this five amino acids or pentapeptide, and the last two amino acids are D-alanine, D-alanine. And remember that once that disaccharide complex is available, then peptidoglycan synthase actually takes that and attaches it outside to a cell wall that's already taking place and it forms this sugar-sugar bonds. Now the problem is that vancomycin as I mentioned really grabs on tightly to the last two amino acids and it prevents this peptidoglycan synthase from doing uh, what it should be doing which is to take this sugar and flip it around and attach it to the cell wall which is already take, uh, being synthesized. So as a result of uh, this, in presence of vancomycin, bacteria will not be able to complete the cell wall and it will end up having bactericidal effect. So the obvious question then is how does vancomycin attach itself to those uh, alanine, alanine residues? So here's, uh, this looks fairly complicated but bear with me, it's fairly simple actually to think about it. Here's our vancomycin and it's a cyclic uh, glycopeptide. Here's the glycopart, which is the two sugars, and here's the cyclic peptide itself. Now, uh, here I have shown in blue uh, the uh, pentapeptide that's attached to NAM sugar, and that's alanine L-glutamate D-lysine, but we don't care so much about the first three amino acids. It's the last two amino acids which are really critical for this interaction, and these are again alanine, D-alanine, D-alanine, and here's our terminal D-alanine, and this is the second to the last alanine. 
So if you look at this uh, red arrows, it tells you the sites of interaction. So essentially there are five hydrogen bonds occurring between the two alanine residues and vancomycin. And you don't need to worry about the specific positions on vancomycin, but just understand that three of these hydrogen bonds are actually part of the last dialanine residue or the terminal dialanine residue. So I wanted to just pose a question, and that is what would happen if this terminal dialanine wasn't there? What if that was substituted with another amino acid? Would we get this interaction? And the answer is no, we wouldn't. And what would happen in terms of the effect of the drug in that case? Well, in that case, the drug would not be very effective because its effectiveness is dependent on how tightly it's able to bind uh, to the pentapeptide. So keep that in mind because that is relevant to a form of resistance that I'll talk about. So coverage of vancomycin, as I already mentioned, is mostly gram-positive because the drug does not get into gram-negative bacteria. It's too big to enter through the porin structures. Another aspect of coverage is anaerobic coverage, and that is very important, particularly uh, coverage against Clostridium difficile. This is one of the very few antibiotics that we have that can have an effect on Clostridium difficile and C. diff, as you know, is a problem when it comes to colitis. So this is a very useful antibiotic, not just because of its gram-positive coverage, but because of its uh, anaerobic coverage. Now, as far as the gram-positive coverage, it has, of course, exon coverage on most uh, staph bacteria, as well as streptococci bacteria. And in terms of Enterococcus bacteria, it has good coverage against Enterococcus faecalis. The remarkable thing is that we now have an antibiotic that is very effective against MRSA or methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Now remember, this is because uh, MRSA arises because the penicillin binding protein has changed and we lose the ability uh, of these uh, beta lactams to enter into uh, the site within the penicillin binding protein and cause any covalent modification. Vancomycin, on the other hand, has a different mechanism of action altogether, so it has good activity against MRSA. In terms of ADME and adverse effects, vancomycin, as I already mentioned, has poor oral absorption. Having said that, uh, you may see oral vancomycin used, but when it's used, that's usually for the treatment of diarrhea and colitis. That's uh, a result of an infection uh, by Clostridium difficile. So here, oral vancomycin is used uh, for its local effect, not because it's not because it's absorbed or anything. It is cleared by the kidneys, and it does have uh, some CSF penetration, so that can be useful. The problem with vancomycin uh, is the adverse effects, and these are uh, not too much of a problem anymore because uh, it's recognized how to deal with them. But one of them is phlebitis, and of course that happens when it's infused rapidly. So now when we infuse it fairly slowly, uh, then it's not a big issue. Autotoxicity and, and nephrotoxicity are rare and mild. Um, they're, they're, they tend to worsen when we combine with aminoglycosides because aminoglycosides are also autotoxic and nephrotoxic. Another, a more common effect we see with vancomycin is what's known as red man syndrome or sometimes referred to as a red neck syndrome. And this involves uh, itching and rash uh, that tends to be on the face, neck, and upper torso. And this is caused by a sudden release of cytokines when vancomycin is infused, particularly if it's infused um, more rapidly. So again, uh, with a slow infusion, uh, this is normally avoided. Uh, but if it does occur, usually it's taken care by uh, using NSAIDs uh, such as aspirin. Now we have to talk about vancomycin resistance because this has become a big issue now. Remember, vancomycin was useful in the first place because of resistant strains of Staphylococcus aureus. Well, now we have strains that are resistant to vancomycin. And there are three types of resistance strains that we need to talk about. One is known as FISA or vancomycin intermediate resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This is where the staph requires 
higher than normal concentrations of vancomycin, and that's why it's called intermediate resistant. Then we have Staph aureus that's completely resistant, and that's vancomycin resistant Staph aureus or Versa. And then we also have a very similar uh, resistance that occurs in enterococci, and that's vancomycin resistant enterococci or VRE. Mechanistically, Versa and uh, VRE are very similar, uh, if not the same. So let's talk about the intermediate resistance that we get, or VSA. And this is seen where the suddenly the MIC uh, required to inhibit the Staphylococci bacteria is 4 to 8 microgram per mil. Um, so it's more than normal. And mechanistically what has happened is that the bacteria have now uh, developed a means by which they can thicken the cell wall. So the cell wall is much thicker than it normally is. And what that does is that it restricts the access vancomycin has to uh, the enzymes that are present within the cell wall that's being uh, constructed. Not the enzyme, but the pentapeptide and so forth. So the drug has difficult time reaching the targets. So you would need higher concentration. Some strains, in fact, do something else. And that is they begin to synthesize this decoys, D-alanine, D-alanine dipeptides, which are not part of the pentapeptide, they're just free dipeptides that are released and they will just go around and sequester or quench the drug wherever it happens to be and absorb it. And that results in uh, re a requirement for uh, giving even a higher concentration of drug to overcome those decoys that are being produced by the bacteria. So these are the mechanisms by which uh, we have uh, this visa type resistance in staph aureus. Another uh, resistance that's more severe, which is complete resistance to vancomycin, and that occurs in staph aureus as well as in enterococci, and it's recognized as VRSA or VRE, and that's caused by a more dramatic change uh, that's caused by several genes that have been named as VAN genes or VAN gene cluster. So there are many of these genes present, and they are all required to do one thing, and that thing is that now the terminal D-alanine uh, in the pentapeptide has been replaced by a D-lactate. Okay, a single change completely disrupts this uh, interaction between vancomycin and the pentapeptide. Because remember, I told you that for this interaction to occur, it heavily depends on these three uh, bonds. Uh, hydrogen bonds with the terminal D-alanine, and in absence of those three, uh, we essentially lose most of the affinity uh, that the drug has for this pentapeptide. So as a result of this, the bacteria become smart in a sense. They uh, now substitute the D-lactate instead of D-alanine, and the affinity is a thousand times lower compared to a D-alanine, D-alanine uh, normal situation. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to just briefly mention, and that is how Versa was evolved. And uh, I sort of uh, presented this first time in 2003 when I was teaching this course for the first time. There was a report in Science uh, where they actually found this transfer of resistance from Entrococcal faecalis species to Staph aureus. And so this was in a diabetes patient who was recovering from foot ulcer infection. And in that patient, they isolated uh, the enterococcal faecalis uh, that was resistant to vancomycin. So this was a VRE, uh, a VRE uh, strain. And in the same patient, they found that Staphylococcus aureus, which was MRSA strain, was not responding to vancomycin. So meaning that it must have acquired the vancomycin resistance from somewhere. And in fact, they went ahead and sequenced the genome of that uh, staph aureus, and they found that it had the same sequence as the E. faecalis in terms of the resistance to vancomycin. So the reason that this enterococcal faecalis must have transferred those resistance genes uh, to staph aureus. And those resistance genes 
contain the van cluster that I'm talking about, the cluster that allows the bacteria to substitute the terminal dialanin to a lactate so it no longer binds vancomycin. And that gene cluster is present in part of this transposone within E. faecalis, and that transposone is called TN1546. And that transposone was part of a conjugated plasmid that went from E. faecalis to uh, Staph aureus. Now, uh, that means that the Staph aureus was already resistant to methicillin, so it was already MRSA, but now it's resistant to vancomycin, so it has become Versa, so it's MRSA plus Versa. And TN56, uh, which made a jump from VRE to the Staph aureus, also contains other resistance genes. It's in fact, once uh, a bacteria gets this transposon, it becomes resistant to most beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, rifampin, macrolides. So this is a significant jump uh, where we have now a strain of Staphylococci aureus that is super resistant to uh, most drugs, including vancomycin. Tycoplanin is the other drug in this category of naturally derived uh, cyclic glycopeptides. Um, and this is very similar uh, to vancomycin. And there's only one thing uh, uh, that's different. So it's similar in a sense that it's a cyclic peptide and it has this sugar molecules. But one thing that's different from vancomycin is this lipophilic chain that I have uh, highlighted with a red box. And this actually increases the potency of the drug because it allows the drug to get even closer uh, to the cell membrane and directly interfere with synthesis that's occurring more closely more closer uh, to the membrane. Now tycoplanin uh, has increased potency of course but it actually inspired because of this lipophilic chain it inspired uh, syn uh, discovery of a whole new category of these drugs known as semi-synthetic glycopeptides where modifications similar to this lipophilic chain were made to see if we can make these drugs even uh, better. Tycoplanin, as I mentioned, has the same mechanism of action as vancomycin. Coverage is the same. Uh, in terms of ADME, it has better uh, distribution in the body. It's intramuscular uh, drug. And it's same as uh, vancomycin in terms of elimination. Uh, it's renally eliminated. Adverse effect is the same, but the Redman syndrome that I was talking about is less common with tycoplanin than it is with vancomycin.